And you knew the first one, I love thee? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, answered prayers. Uh, again, I don't know that there's anything best or better to do in that than when we see that taking place. Uh, so we started off last night, as I said, we had prayer meeting over at Fox's Hollow. And first thing off the bat, there was, uh, and, and again, this is one of the issues that, you know, somebody tells me, oh, I'm, I'm saved, I'm, I'm okay, I'm, I'm, and again, it's like I, I, I take it for what it is and the integrity of their heart, but one of the things that I've learned is the test of time. Uh, how people, how much people stay at it, stay with it. You know, uh, when I talk about uh, us doing uh, this church work and the faithfulness that's needed in this, uh, first first Sunday, first two Sundays, uh, uh, excitement because it's new, it's adventurous, it's uh, something different, and people, you know, emotions get up and things like that. It's the consistency that stays with it in a Bible study, in Bible readings, in prayer. It's any of the spiritual disciplines. Uh, and if you back away from any of those spiritual disciplines, uh, it gets harder to get back to it. It's a struggle. That's the weakness of it. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak in that. So uh, last night, uh, the opening uh, testimony was that there was an individual that was there. He said, my brother been alcohol, drugs, uh, out of church, uh, and, you know, and again, I've, I've known this guy for 25 years, 30 years, uh, and his his routine is he'll get back in church, uh, and he goes to a Pentecostal church, and he'll get slain in the spirit, and speak in tongues, and uh, he's just on fire for the Lord, and, and again, I rejoice with him. I, I pray that he maintains, and I hope that he maintains, but the track record, is, is that four or five months down the road, uh, I'll, I'll say to him, I'll say, how's your brother? And what will be the report? Well, he's back out of church. He's back in the drug scene. He's back, and again, it becomes this repeated behavior. Uh, that's like I said, the one guy over there who came to me that he had repented of his sins uh, and he wanted to get back right with God. And again, wonderful news to hear, right? He's only been baptized 14 times. I don't know if you know that old country song they baptized Jesse Taylor down in Cedar Creek last Sunday. Uh, that, how many times do you get baptized before it really takes? Mm -hmm. uh, so this idea is that uh, I believe in the power of God. That when he saves a soul, he keeps the soul. That when he works a work in the lives of people, it's maintained. So answered prayer of these kind of things and testimonies of them of to say... Uh, you know, I'm going on decades, not just days, weeks, or months, or years. I'm going on decades of walking with the Lord in His faithfulness. Backslide, fall, sin, absolutely. But it is the testimony of time, the one that gets up the next morning and says, I'm getting right back to it. I fell this week, I sinned this week, I'm getting right back up to it. I'm not losing ground. That resolve uh, is a hard thing to find today. And it's not self-made. It's not self-taught. Uh, that's the power of the Holy Spirit that draws. When you start to go away, he draws uh, to say, come back, come back, come back. You see that throughout all the Old Testament. The children of Israel, how many times did he plead with them? How many prophets did he send to them? Uh, once again saying, get back, get back, get back. Uh, you're falling away. You're falling. I mean, he gave them scores of thousands of invitations to get back. Now, the tragedy is when that invitation continues to come to people. They hear it, they know it, but they won't do it. And there's two passages of Scripture that says that. You profess me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. So that's the reason I always joke about being a quack cardiologist. We, we are examiners of, of our hearts. Uh, how is your heart? How's your, how's your walk with the Lord in this? So, uh, you know, again, I rejoice when I hear answered prayer to celebrate, uh, but, I, but I cringe a little bit is to say, I know what's coming. And again, the fearfulness of that is, is that it doesn't have to be that way. So for us here today, in Psalm, again, back to Psalms, 
uh, I want to I want to bring you a passage of scripture here, 127, right back over from where I gave you that. To, his mercy endures forever. And I just want to take this first verse, 127. There's only five verses in it. Uh, and this is uh, one of those shorter psalms about Jerusalem, celebration of Israel, and all that Judah means to the Lord. But it's that first, first verse there that I think for us in developing, building a church, uh, future, where we're at, where we're going, those kind of things that we understand the concept of exactly uh, what is Christianity. As a matter of fact, I saw last night, meant to bring it, and I'm sure I've got one somewhere in all, all of our stuff here, of the, the salvation cube. You all know what the salvation cube is? Well, I'll try to remember. Carl, you coming over to Foxitalo today? Or, okay, try to remind me to get that cube, but I'll... Uh, with me, remind me on that. Uh, the salvation cube, again, how many sides are there on the cube? Six. Each side is a step of understanding the gospel. You know, uh, I threw a lady for a loop the other day because I've been known to do, I did this over at Fox's Hall, at some point we're going to do this. I made every one of them that declared that they was a Christian get up and tell their testimony. You know what that did to them? Scared him to death. Uh, and, and, <laughs> what? I gotta get up and say something? I gotta get up and talk? But it was the practice of getting up and sharing how they came to Christ. Uh, and again, it shouldn't be that much of uh, uh, exercise, but the practice of that, of being able to say, hey, someone give me your testimony. And someone immediately step up, jumped up and to say, oh, I just gotta share how Jesus saved me. This is how I got saved. And share their testimony. Now, again, the importance of that is, is because uh, here we are to the fifth month of this year, and how many times have you shared your testimony with someone? How many times has someone asked you about your salvation, your eternity? And we keep getting the answers back. I haven't shared the gospel with anybody. And nobody's come to me and asked me about my soul. So this negating of Christianity is the reason that church, church attendance and salvation continues to drop in our nation today because ain't nobody talking about it. Well, I'll make a man. They're, 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 they don't want to talk about that. Well, yeah, there, there are many of people like that. They don't want to talk about <coughs> heaven or hell. They don't want to talk about eternity. But that ain't going to keep them from going there, is it? This means no. This means yes. Is it going to keep them from going to hell or heaven if we don't talk about it? No. They're still going to go there. So the answer to this is, is to say, how, how are we going to build this? How are we going to do this work that God has, has laid upon us as an opportunity of, to grow, develop in our walk with him individually, families, and as a church? So in Psalm 127, let's read this and then go to the Lord in prayer for his blessing on the word. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchmen, they wake but in vain. It is a vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the, en the enemies up in the gate. Let's pray. Blessed Father, would you honor the testament and realization, Father, of this, that how much we need you for everything, our very days, existence, life, provisions, our very salvation, redemption, Lord, is all found in the care and keeping of your mighty hands. There is no event, Lord, that is going to happen this day or in the future that will not happen without your permission or your activity in doing it or causing it. All things proceed from you. So, Lord, when we talk about our walk with you, our relationship with you, help us to understand the importance of this. When we talk about a church, when we talk about a testimony, a witness in this community, Lord, it is again a realization we need you. How much we need you. Lord, again, that we would come to this today to plead with you, to cry out to you for all the sorrows of this life and the sorrows of our community and roundabout. Lord, again, that cry goes up. We need you. Lord, may you send your Holy Spirit 
in the fullest of fashion, Lord, to be in this room, to be upon these people, to take us, that we would understand our relationship with you this day, not only converse about it, not only meditate on it, but to do a life that is living it, practicing it, and maintaining it. I pray, Father, for these things because it honors and glorifies you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask and pray. Amen. So back uh, the, the other verses here I'm not going to so much deal with. Uh, again, it's the context of it. It's that first verse, and especially that first phrase, that I want you to uh, latch hold of. And again, it's a, it is a priority for us to understand this and implement it for us as individuals, for us as families, and as a church. Except the Lord build the house. If he don't, in other words, if he don't do it, then is it going to be maintained? Absolutely not. So in this, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain. This, again, is with the Lord's help and the Lord's direction, and the Lord's power in this. When you go back to the book of Acts and you look at the church, it wasn't established by men. They went into an upper room, they waited ten days, they prayed and fasted, and on the tenth day the Holy Spirit came and the gospel flooded. I think it was one of the kids that studying, Philip Jacob, was it you? Studying Christianity's growth? It was asking about how, how Christianity grew in the Roman Empire um, in that first century and, and the magnitude of that. And dialogue, our conversation, uh, don't, don't bother that, please. I didn't make uh, the money or not. And again, the activity of Christianity in our society today is not talked about. It's very well, it's very hard to find someone that's living it out. Now, there are a lot of religious people in church today. There are a lot of religious people that are on the on the charts today, on the membership rolls of the church today. But the real Christian that's doing it seven days a week, 365 days a year, those are the ones that you latch hold of and that you say, now that's Christianity because it's an everyday experience. The re relationship of this is that unless the Lord does the work, of, first of all, the initial point of salvation. There is no man that gets up some morning, a woman, a child gets up some morning and says, I think I'm going to be a Christian today. They get up and God comes and meets them with their Holy Spirit and he reaches inside their chest and he grabs a hold of their soul. And with that mighty hand of God, he says, now you've heard the gospel. You're, you're a lost man, a lost woman, a lost child, and you are in offense against man, but yet I love you. Now again, the contract. I hate the sin that's being done in your life and the choices that you're making, but I love you because you're made in my image because I gave my son for you, John 3, 16. Anybody quote that? Boy, that, that's weak. <laughs> Boy, that is weak. Get a bull, bullhorn for you all. For, for God so did what? Love the world. Grabs in that soul and says, I love you. So much that I gave my son for you. So that even though you are walking contrary to me, I can make you mine. Now again, this unless the Lord does this, that person will never come to Christ. So when, some, when you're talking to someone about their walk with him, about coming to church, about being a Christian. And they'll say, someday, I'll get around to it sometime. You know, I've been thinking about that. The automatic retort answer to that is, they'll never make it. No man makes the choice on this. God comes. And God fills them with his Holy Spirit under conviction. You ever been under conviction? This means yes. This means no. Under conviction, mm -hmm. sorrow of heart, grieved over what I've done. You want to know the first sign that you'll never be saved, that the person will never be saved, is there is no conviction of sin. They used to sorrow over it. They used to get upset by it. When you lose conviction of sin, and again, in our society where everything now that is evil called good and good called evil and rights were wrong and wrongs were right, in that day and age, that generation ago that's being lost in this generation, that is one of the first signs is that salvation is departing from the land side. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain. So build all the churches, 
Start a church. Come together. Make pat yourself on the back. Feel good about it. Won't mean nothing unless the Lord's doing it. Salvation comes from God, is of God, by God, in God, for God. That's what it's all about. So he comes. He brings the salvation. He brings the conviction. And the soul of being receptive. Now here's John 1.12. Again, these are verses that I would love for you to know. Because again, you're, you get out there and the encouragement that I hope someday is that we become active evangelists. And you know, again, you want to know one of the things that would please God more than anything? We never get one more person to attend here at church. But we're able to witness to 10,000 people in the surrounding counties and share with them the gospel. The Lord would be pleased with that. Just sit down with a stranger, a family member, a neighbor, and just say, look, I want to talk to you about the Lord. I'm going to talk to you about your relationship with him. Well, I, I'm going to go to my church, or I'm going to get in this church, or that church. Fine, wonderful. I just want to talk to you about your soul. And be able to say to them, have you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? John 1.12. Now, you knew John 3.16. Faintly. <laughs> weakly. Do you know John 1.12? You know? No. To as many as would receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, the children of God. It is adamant that when the Lord builds the house of salvation on a person, on a family, on a group. Now again, this is for our community. When I'm looking at our, our surrounding area, and I'm looking at homes for God to do a work of building his namesake. That foundation is laid in Christ Jesus, and I want to know what they received. If they have not received Christ into their hearts and their life, then what have they received? Sin? Self? Satan? So the idea of presenting them just to say, look, you, you are walking contrary to God. You're walking, in, you're not, you're building in vain a life. What are people living for? You know the old saying, if you, whatever you're, what, are you, what is worth dying for? Soldiers go into the Army, the Marines, Navy, yeah. Air Force, and they are willing to lose their life for the cause of the American way, right? The martyrs uh, of Islam, at, at least, and that is that you've got to tip your hat out of respect. You may don't agree with it, of course, but are they not willing to die for their cause? I mean, I'm sorry, but a suicide bomber is, you know, again, we they, that person is nuts. But they're, they're inflamed in their passion to do that. What is, what is persecution church? They had, a, they had a world religious persecuted church gathering by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association and Franklin Graham down in Washington, D.C. And they had 600 families, individuals that had been persecuted around the world. And they stood and they shared their story about how Muslims had come in cut their hands off and poke their eyes out and sent them in the fire and all the horrors that they've seen going on around the world. And then there was other religious leaders, Ravi Zacharias, Jack Graham, others that I saw that were on there. Uh, Doug Small was there, these people that I've labored with in prayer. They were all there because, again, the great need of this world today is the persecuted church. Christianity has lost more people in the last year than any other religion. We've lost more Christians in the last 10 years, uh, they say, in this last generation, than all the other 2,000 years of Christianity put together. The assault of Satan is that he is killing Christians left and right, ISIS and all the damage that is there. And where is the American church at? Sitting casually in their padded pews and their air conditioning, uh, celebrating that I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. What are we living for? And what are we worth dying for? So this adage of that when I receive Christ is that we take on that mentality. What did Christ do? He came, left his throne on heaven, came down as a man, born of a virgin, lived his life for 30 years, serving there in Nazareth, and all of a sudden now, 30 years of age, he comes forth and he begins doing miracles. He comes forth beginning to preach parables. He comes forth preaching and teaching to the multitudes of the Jews, of the Pharisees, and the Pharisees, what did they say? 
you're not going to tell us what we're going to do. And so much so that in three years' time that they orchestrated it, that they, they would betray him, crucify him, and that they would put that to silence in that. But Jesus said, I came to be a light in this world of darkness. When you look out there, what do you see, light or darkness? When you look at these maps, do you see light or darkness? That's what God sees. He sees in the homes. He sees in the hearts. Am I building this foundation? For the next generation, for for the for the community that you're living in, why is there so much of this evil headlines that I talk about, and then we pray against in this because of the absence of the foundation being laid in this in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, unless you build it, we're laboring in vain. So I can read as much Bible as I want, I can record as many sermons as I want, I can play as many hymns as I want. We can do all these things, but if we are not laying the foundation of our future in Christ Jesus in our day-to-day -day walk, then it will, no, it will all be in vain. Now, I don't know about you, but in vain, uh, that garbage can that's out there, that's where all vanity goes. It's, it's garbage. It amounts to nothing. So when you look at people's lives, what are you working for? What, what are you laboring for? And a Christian's answer is what? What are, we, what are we all about? Eternity. We're getting ready for eternity. I asked someone the other day, one of these are the cancer patients that we're talking about, uh, and bad news and, and worsening news as the results and all that keeps coming forward. And I said to them, and I said, yes, I said, but in 60 years, of 60 some odd years of life, I said, what is that going to be compared to in eternity? And he said, just a boring, just, just a nothing. And he said, but again, the whole focus is turned to that. I'm living my life to die so that I can live forever with him. Do you understand the concept of that? But yet when you look at most people's activity on a seven-day-a-week process, it's about money, it's about self, it's about entertainment, it's about my life, my plans, my priorities. And somewhere along the line, we ought to understand we're building a foundation in vain. So a church. We lay the foundation. Lord, help us to build this. For this reason, you're going to hear me pray that all the time. And I ask that. I pray that. Pray in agreement with me. If two of you, in, in the book of Luke, it says, if two of you shall agree as touching anything here on this earth, it shall be done for you in heaven. So when we anoint Elizabeth with oil and to pray over her, and you all, brothers and sisters, pray, I agree with that prayer. I'm, in, I'm praying that prayer. Guess what God's doing in heaven? He's hearing the prayer, and he's saying, they're in agreement. That prayer is not in vain. <coughs> it's being laid in the foundation of the name Jesus. Why the name Jesus? Because if you ask anything in my name, John 14, 15, if you ask anything in my name, Jesus said, what will happen? It shall be done. <coughs> John, John 16, now my mind's getting fuzzy. John 16, 24, Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive. What are we asking for? Lord, lay the foundation. Build it in Jesus Christ. Build it in my heart. Build it in my family. Build it in my church. That we are having our focus on you, Lord. That we have a testimony to go out and share, and the boldness to go out and share. Are you scared to death for me to send you out right now? To send you down to Sheets and the first Joe, the first Jane that you see down at Sheets, you have, she just got that uh, cube back here. The, for the first person that you run into when you pull into the parking lot, you have to go witness to them. You ever been given an assignment like that? Mm -hmm. I did it over at Augusta. I did it on a Tuesday night. They all showed up and I kept asking how many people you witnessed to. How many people you shared the gospel with? And they kept week after week. And I got frustrated. I got aggravated. I said, no Bible study tonight. I said, get two by two, get in your car, and get to the first house that you come to, you have to stop and go talk to them. Oh, 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 don't do that to us. No, oh, no, that's not fair. And, and I said, and then come back here and tell me what happened. Well, you would have thought that, that there would have been a bunch of teenagers after a football game had come back in there. They, oh, good, good. Let's let me tell you what happened. And, and just all kinds of excitement and that. 
But boy, I'm telling you, I said, boy, what a difference an hour makes. An hour ago, he was ready to lynch me, throw, throw a chair at me. No, don't do that to us. But I made them. I forced them. Now, again, strong arming people to do things like that. It might work for a moment. But what good does that do if you don't maintain it? To him that knows to do James 4, 17, to him that knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is what? Sin. So being in the Word, laying a foundation daily in the Word, in prayer, in witnessing, if it's not done in the Lord, it's done in vain. And if it's not done at all, life is vain. What was Solomon's famous line over there in Ecclesiastes? Anybody remember that? Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. If you don't, Lord, if you don't build this house, if you don't work in my life, if you don't answer our prayers, then this thing called life is all vain. I'm working for nothing. I'm living for nothing. But when you're building a kingdom for him in your heart, in your surroundings, in your community, that is not in vain. That's the reason that I say to a broken heart, you ever had your heart broke? You ever bowed in, in the quietness of your, of your prayer time for someone else, for yourself? And in the sorrow of your heart, Lord, if you don't help me, we need you. No cheers in vain in the presence of God. Selfish cheers. Pity parties, you, know, you ever had, you've had them, right? You know, poor me. Nobody's got as bad as I do. You want to show, show you some places that's got it worse than what we got it? There are other worse things going on in this world than the conditions that we have. Kids, when they have a difficulty or issues and things like that, I always say, I said, now just think about them children being bombed over in Iraq right now. Kind of puts it in perspective, really, how bad is it in our, our affairs of life? It's not that bad, is it? So the idea of this purpose, getting ready for eternity, making a testament, living a testament, sharing your testimony is because you, the Lord has laid a foundation, built a city within you of a relationship with Him, and He's working in you to make you like Him. The definition of a Christian means that we are to be Christ-like. And if we're not becoming Christ-like, and we're becoming more world-like, or more selfish-like, then we're living in vain. Our foundation, our prayer for one another, make Christ in all of us. Now what I open with, I want to come back to that. Again, if the foundation is laid in Christ, and we fall into sin, or we're practicing sin, or there's sin named among us, then we come back to that. Let's go back to the foundation. Who was you saved in? Who was you saved from? You know, somebody says, oh, I'm saved. And then the question comes back, what was you saved from? I was saved from sin. I was saved from cussing. I was saved from pride. I was saved from anger. I was saved from lust. I was saved from all these things. If he's the Savior, then he shall save, thou shalt call his name Jesus. And he shall save them from their sins. What was you saved from? Now, again, we listen to people's testimonies of somebody that was brought out of alcoholism or, or drug addiction or some horrible sin. People were in jail and they said, I, was, I murdered these people. And I found Christ. And they have great testimonies. Those are dramatic testimonies. But isn't it just as much that we would take, for example, Rebecca back there and say she lives a life of purity, lives a life of wholesomeness, a life of righteousness, and that Satan can't get into her life or destroy her? Because my golly, uh, and again, I hate the horrible headlines, and I, I use them too much, I think, for some people, but... I saw this past week, it just come out Friday. This is one of those things happened Friday. Back in January, eight-year-old boy uh, out in Cincinnati, Ohio. I, I saw the video. They showed the video that was on the school campus. He's walking into the bathroom. And these two other boys that were bigger than him, I don't know whether they 
hit his head off the wall or punched him. I don't know. I couldn't see exactly, but he just drops. He lays on the floor for six minutes on that video camp. Other kids kick him, poke him, prod him, seeing what he's doing, laying there on the floor. Now, one person helped that kid. Finally, an assistant principal shows up, and, and you know, two days later, that eight-year-old boy commits suicide, kills himself. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't know, I'm going to go back and I remember, eight, eight years old, I didn't even know what suicide was, nor would I know how to implement it or do it. But what's on the scourge on our society today? That an eight-year-old knows how to do it and follows through with it. Isn't that, isn't that a condemnation on us as a people? And what kind of foundation does that lay? Is God not able to overcome, deliver, protect, redeem an eight-year-old boy? An 80-year-old? Absolutely. My God's able. You won't answer me on that, so I'll answer. My God is able. So that when I hear someone to say, hey, my brother's back out of drugs, he's back in church, he's slain in the spirit and all this. Wonderful, wonderful. Hope this time it takes. Hey, I'm getting baptized for the 15th time. Hopefully this takes. The foundation's being laid. I... Revivals, like Duncan Campbell. Duncan Campbell made this the 1949 Hebrides Revival. And here's a statement. He says, we know nothing of backsliding. You want to know what the purest of joy would be for this church, these people? Not one of us would know anything of backsliding. You want to know what prayer to offer for each other? For the rest of May? For the rest of this year? Lord, not one of us to crumble our foundation laid in Jesus Christ. Because if I laid my foundation being that I was baptized, that I'm a church member, that I'm doing good, trying to be good, then my foundation is vain. But if my foundation be laid and built by Christ Jesus, it's the sure thing. And I want to ask you, you got to go share your testimony. What do you have to share? What is your foundation? I was sinking deep in sin, far from my Lord, very deeply, staying within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the seas heard my despairing cry. From sinking sand, he lifted me. Well, I like that old song. <coughs> I'm not going to sing it. From sinking sand, he lifted me. You know, that, that come out of a song where David wrote, I was down in the mud and the muck and the mire, and God reached down, pulled me up out of that, and he set me upon the rock, and he established my goings, and he put a new song in my mouth. You remember that day? I was lost. I got up that morning, and I was lost. I had no foundation other than my good works. I was trying to be good. But that day, he reached in my soul. And he said, from sinking sand, I'll pull you. I want to know where your heart's at. I want to know where your life's at. I want to know where your foundation is laid and who you're serving. What are you living for? What are you worth dying for? You know, it, it's, be, it's, be, it's a small window, but it's beginning to happen. We didn't see it any this year, and at the close of last year, we didn't see it. But in the end of 2015, into the first half of 2016, we began to see people coming into church, church meetings, and open fire on churches. Now, that's a direct assault of Satan against the gospel. So people started praying. Lord, protect our church service. Don't let this evil happen. And again, as we pray for the schools, now we've got to pray for the churches. And down at Bellevue Baptist in Memphis, Tennessee, they had a security guard. They had a, they have a out, outside foyer walk, a walk around, and they saw a guy had a backpack, and he saw the gun, gun holster poking out of the bag. And there was a security officer, and they got the guy because he had planned. 
to go into that, which was live TV, and open fire right there on the spot. Now, again, you hear those incidents. We haven't heard any for quite some time. But again, the old Columbine High School episode that they talk about when he said, oh, you are Christian? Well, prepare to meet your God. Well, guess what? The book of Amos already tells us that. Prepare to meet your God. Lay the foundation in Christ. Live for him and be willing to die for him. Lord, here's my life. Whatever you want in me, whatever you want through me, I'm no longer mine, I'm yours. Lord, I'm not right with you this day. This is Mother's Day. We celebrate that. But Lord, uh, you know, again, I, I want to be what you want me to be all the days of my life. But I can't do it on my own. Lay the foundation. Don't let me labor in vain. And Lord, not just me, but all these that are gathered here with us. Lord, build the foundation in Christ Jesus. You got your loved one that's on your heart and your mind. Set them before the Lord. Oh, Holy Spirit, reach into their soul. Grab it, claim it, keep it. No more backslide. No more failures. No more faults. Pure, holy, righteous, sanctified living in Christ Jesus. But when the Holy Spirit comes down, he floods the soul. And he keeps us in life. Don't let me fall, Lord. Don't let me fail. And he says, grant it. Boy, what a prayer that is. What a prayer that is. So again, except the Lord build the house, the Lord don't do it, we're laboring in vain. We're laying a foundation in our future. If it's not in the Lord, what's going to, what's going to come of it? Vanity. If you're striving in your life and living for yourself and for other attainments, it's all in vain. What are you doing for eternity? So our, our, our priorities here that I established, Bible, prayer, mission, those th things, sharing the gospel uh, in that. Go forth. Tell others. Ask us. Where are you at? Where are you going to spend eternity? Have you received him? Has he filled you? Are you living for him? Is your name in the Lamb's Book of Life? I mean, whatever phrase, verse that you want to use in that, and make it a practice that every week we can come in. And we'll hear the feet. Oh, I knocked on their door and I said, I want to talk to you about your soul, and they slammed the door in my face. Yeah, that happens. Oh, they, they, they cussed me and ran it and raved and said, who are you to ask me? Who are you to talk to me? Yeah, you're going to have that. But you're going to come along that individual that God has prepared. And they're going to be in a moment and a time that they're looking for answers and for direction. And God sets you there for such a time as that. And that you're able to say, let me tell you what Jesus did for me. But if Jesus didn't do anything for you, then you ain't got nothing to share. Talk about yourself there. One of the few times you'll ever hear me say that. Talk about yourself. Tell them what the Lord did for you. This is how I got saved. This is what happened that day that I met Jesus. And I ain't never been the same since. But you see, if you said, oh, back, back, I'll just use a year. 1972, I got saved. But then I fell out with the Lord in 1974. I went back in 1976 and I fell back out in 1978. I got back in 1980, but you see the pattern? 16th time getting baptized. Trying to do it again. Going to try to keep up with it. Make it three weeks, two weeks fall away. Make it five weeks, eight weeks fall away. That kind of behavior. Is that the Lord keeping us? <coughs> that's not a foundation that's laid. That's a crack foundation. And it doesn't glorify Him. So there's something missing. And the answer to that is the Lord's missing. Amen. Study yourself. Study your heart. 